welcome everybody to this uh, series of lectures on statistics. Everything you always wanted to know about statistics, but were afraid to ask. And to answer the first question that popped up, yes, all these lectures will be recorded. I'm recording it right now. And they'll be shared via DAC website. We'll put them here at this URL here uh, when, when the recording is ready together with uh, handouts, lecture slides. Let me introduce myself. My name is Marek Gierlinski. I'm part of the data analysis group at uh, here at the University of Dundee College, uh, School of Life Sciences. Uh, the other member of this group is James Abbott, and we collaborate on various types of projects with people across uh, SLS and also outside sometimes. Really, various types of projects uh, include RNA seq, proteomics, various other types of data analysis, or even modeling. If in future you you need help with data analysis, with statistics, we are here uh, to help. <clears throat> and I mentioned this already that lecture slides and videos will be available at this address. Okay, uh, there will be maths in this lecture. Uh, don't feel intimidated. You can't do statistics without maths. I will try to keep and accessible, but there will be some uh, complicated concepts introduced uh, in this lectures, uh, and it will require some effort to to understand them. <clears throat> Please do not run away after the first lecture. I promise you it will be worth sitting for all of them. This is the outline of all the lectures, there will be um, actually 14 of them. I'm not sure whether it's 13 here. Uh, there are 14 lectures. Uh, the first few, the first four lectures will focus on uncertainties and error analysis in, in biology. Then I will tell you something about how to make a good plot about data presentation. And the rest is broadly covering uh, statistical testing, various types of tests like t-test or ANOVA and other tests. I will also talk about statistical power, which is an important topic, and multiple test corrections, which are often forgotten. And then end with linear models and a closing lecture about what's wrong uh, with p-values. Today, probability distributions. And I will start with this quote from Stephen Jay Gould. Misunderstanding of probability might be the greatest of all general impediments to scientific literacy, uh, take this to heart. Understanding of probability and statistics is quite important, not only in science, but also in everyday life. Understanding all the COVID data that is uh, flooding us through, through the media. Uh, without basic understanding of statistics, uh, you, you might misinterpret many things, as some journalists do, for example. Consider this very simple example. You, uh, you estimate bacterial concentration using a spectrophotometer. You put your sample here in this, uh, in this vial. You place it in the instrument, and this instrument measures uh, OD60, which is the optical density at 600 nanometers, which is proportional to the concentration of bacteria in this sample. And now you do this experiment in six replicas. That means you take a sample, an aliquot from your culture, you put it in a vial and you measure it and you do it again, again and again. And every time you repeat your experiment, you get a slightly different value. Okay, you measure the same thing. You repeat the experiment under the same conditions several times. And every time you do this, uh, you get a different result. Uh, this is natural. This is nothing to be worried about. This is uh, everyday life, everyday practice in biology and all experimental scientists, sciences. Experimental result is a random variable and it follows a certain probability distribution. These two concepts, random variable and a probability distribution. Random variable is something that gives you random numbers. This is a bit of a tautological uh, definition. Random variable is a very strict mathematical concept, very well defined in mathematics, but I'm not going there. 
Uh, in real life, it is related to experiments and measurements. Before you do an experiment, and in this case, it's a very simple experiment of throwing two dice. You don't know what sort of outcome is going to be there, but you know what the, what possible outcomes are. There are all numbers. If you calculate the sum from these two dice, the outcome is a number between two and 12, and there are lots of possibilities. After you have done your experiment, all this uh, sea of possibilities collapses to just one number, let's say number four. So experiment is a realization of a random variable. Random variable gives you possibilities in experiment from all possible values, one is chosen. And now by repeating the experiment multiple times, you can probe this distribution of possibilities and you can reconstruct it empirically and infer about uncertainty of your result. So you can think of an experiment as a random number generator. Generally speaking, there are two types of uh, random variables, discrete and continuous. Uh, discrete variables give you, well, a certain set, a finite set of outcomes. Could be a number, like from the dice, could be a categorical outcome, for example, small, medium, large, uh, could be a number of mice, for example, five. You might argue that this is not a random number because once you have five mice, you measure them, you count them one, two, three, four, five, okay? It's not gonna change if you count it again. But in some experiments, for example, survival experiments, you see after certain treatment, how many mice, for example, survive after two, and that will be a random number in a way that if you repeat your experiment under the same conditions, you might get a different number, five, maybe four, maybe six at a different uh, realization of this experiment. Continuous variable uh, is something like a weight of a mouse or height of a person. It's just a real number without any, any specific values, fluorescent marker, luminosity or protein abundance. There are many other possibilities. So what is a probability distribution? Coming back to our dice, there are 10 possible outcomes, but each outcome, uh, each sum uh, uh, can be obtained by different combinations of two dice. To obtain two outcome of two, there is only one possibility, one plus one, but to obtain four, there are three possibilities, one plus three, two plus two, and three plus one. You can see that some of the outcomes have more possible, more combinations available from the dice than others. And it's, it's shown in, in this plot. This is the outcome of this is number of uh, combinations that lead to this particular outcome. We have 36 combinations possible. This is all, all of them here. And the probability of a given combination of a given outcome of a uh, number of combinations that lead to this divided by 36. That's the probability. The more combinations lead to a given outcome, the more likely a given outcome is. And you can see that outcome of seven is six times more likely than outcome of two. And you can assign a probability. So this is what it, the probability distribution is. It takes all outcomes uh, into account and assigns a probability of a given outcome to it. This is the notation I'm going to use for a discrete random variable. The plot shows um, a probability distribution, slightly different from what I showed you before, but again it's the same. It's a discrete outcome, which is a number here between 0 and 12, and there are various probabilities. And the, the notation I'm going to use throughout these lectures is like this. Capital P means probability. And then X equals K. X is a capital X, it's a random variable. It's just a name, it's a variable name. It's not a number, it's just a symbol I'm going to use. K is the possible outcome, so K is a number. And we can write like this, probability that X equals six is 0.1, because you can see it from this distribution. This is probability of X being six. Probability of X being between five and seven 
and 5 and 7 included is 0.32. This is the sum of these three numbers or area under these three bars. As you can see, probab probabilities are additive. So you simply add these three probabilities. Uh, for a continuous random variable, it's a little bit more complicated. We don't have individual probabilities. We have so-called density function. And this density function describes how probability changes with the value. And we don't consider probability of X being equal to something because it's zero. I will show you in a moment. Typically, we consider a limit, a probability of some of a variable be greater or less than a given limit. And it's simply it's an integral of this density function from a limit to infinity. And as you know, integral is simply area under the curve. So this dark area here, this area, this is the probability that our variable X is greater than 10 in this particular probability distribution. You calculate probability of X being exactly 10, it will be probability of an infinitely narrow area between 10 and 10, which simply is zero. So that, that is not in use. That doesn't make much sense from a statistical point of view. We typically look at tail probabil probabilities and you will see this tail probability through entire lecture series. We'll come back to this again and again and again. The total probability is one. Normal distribution, it's probably the most commonly used, and hence it's named normal, because it's normally seen uh, in nature. It, it appears in nature quite often. Sometimes it is called Gaussian, because uh, Gauss, Carl Friedrich Gauss, a uh, German mathematician, studied this a lot, and it's given by this formula. I don't want you to remember it. I'm just showing this for, for completeness. Uh, the, and there are parameters. This is this is the density function. And there are two parameters, mean and standard deviation. Mean is mu, standard deviation is sigma. Sigma square is called variance. And in this particular case, what you see here is a normal distribution with mean of 10 and standard deviation of one and a half. So mean is right in the middle of a distribution. The distribution is symmetric and it's 10. And this is mean plus and minus uh, sigma this is this range plus minus one standard deviation and in statistics uh, in error analysis in, uh, in statistical testing we usually ask about tail probabilities or probabilities within a certain range for example if you cut off the area this dark shaded area here within plus minus one standard deviation from the mean it will contain about 68.3, about two thirds actually, about two thirds of the crude approximation of, uh, of probability of 68.3%. And then cutting off at various limits will give you uh, different, different numbers. So this table kind of summarizes uh, numbers that are occasionally used. You can of course calculate it using software like R, but it's good to remember some of them. One sigma, two sigma is about 95%. If you want exactly 95%, this is 1.96 times sigma. This is sort of a magic number. It will reappear again through our lecture course, 1.96. So it, it's very close to this line. It's minus 1.696 times sigma plus 1.96 times sigma. And inside this, we would have exactly 95% or 5% outside. And the odds of being out are 1 in 20. Now, as I will tell you and explain in details later, statistical testing is about these odds. If you set a limit, your p-value limit at 5%, then you have one in 20 odds or probability of being wrong when you do your experiment. Uh, physicists, for example, quite often have a three sigma limit where the odds are uh, one in 400. So if you, if you, do, if you did your biological experiment and came to a physicist and told them that you have p-value of 5%, they would probably laugh at you. But that just shows the differences between physics where experiments are often much more precise and accurate uh, than in biology, where biological subjects are so variable, so noisy, then uh, it's very hard to obtain a better result. But remember, 1.96 corresponds to 95% inside and 5% outside. This is a 
real life example of a normal distribution. Uh, this is height for 34 major league baseball players in, uh, in in the United States. It's taken from this website. You can you can check it yourself. And each bar corresponds to the count of players at a given height. The height is is a continuous variable, but for this purposes it was uh, rounded up to the nearest inch. That's why it looks a bit weird. But you can see here very well that that the distribution, real distribution of of heights. Uh, is very well approximated by the normal distribution, which is presented here by a red curve. And the mean in this case is 187.2 centimeters. Why do we call it Gaussian distribution? Well, it comes back to Carl Friedrich Gauss, who was a brilliant uh, German mathematician. Uh, he did lots of things. Uh, his name appears in mathematics all over the place. Uh, He's famous for, uh, for building a regular heptadecagon, which is a, a polygon with uh, 17 sides using ruler and a compass. So this is, this is an old sort of an ancient Greek task using just ruler. Came up with this, uh, this idea, a very elegant idea how to build it. And then he requested that a regular heptadecagon would be inscribed on his tombstone and a, and a stonemason looked at this and said, no way, Gough, I can't do it. It will look like a circle. It was just beyond his abilities to carve such a subtle shape. It's not Gauss, really. It was uh, the uh, Abram de Moivre uh, who, who formulated this normal distribution or something which we call Gaussian long ago, uh, if it Gauss was born. But the name Gaussian stuck to it because he developed it and analyzed it in details. Another distribution I want you to know is log normal distribution. It's quite simple actually. It's a probability distribution of a random variable whose logarithm is normally distributed. Look at this example. This is again a real life example. It's from proteomics. This is a distribution of a certain quantity here. And it looks very asymmetric, very skewed. If you take a logarithm of this value and plot distribution of it, it looks this way. So at this one looks much more like a normal distribution. Not perfectly, it's a bit skewed, but it re resembles a normal distribution uh, better, better than this. Anyway, when we talk about change in nature, Hardly ever the distribution is actually very close to normal. There is, it's an own, only an approximation. Uh, important thing to remember about this that certain uh, uh, rules in statistics simply don't apply to distributions like this. If you plot the mean and mean plus standard deviation and a mean minus standard deviation, it turns out that 96% of uh, values here are within plus minus one sigma. And in normal distribution, I told you it's about two thirds. And after taking a logarithm of this, it looks much better. This is mean plus minus uh, one sigma and about 67% of data of uh, measurements are within one sigma or one standard deviation from the mean. That's why, and for many other reasons, if you have data which are distributed like this, you want to log transform it, you want to take a logarithm of this and then proceed with your analysis. The thing you want to do is always plot the distribution of your data before you do analysis. Uh, why is log normal or taking a logarithm important? Uh, well, for, for various reasons. First of all, there are there are lots of types of measurements, usually high throughput experiments like RNA-seq, arrays, mass spectrometry or drug potency, IC50. All these uh, numbers are typically log normally distributed. So first of all, you want to plot them in the logarithmic scale. And uh, this is the reason for this. This is the same data in the top and bottom uh, panel, but this is direct intensity. Uh, this is actually from RNA-6, so it's a gene expression. Uh, and it's time to the six, so this is uh, 300,000, 200,000 and so on. And as you can see a few data points, but the bulk of data are concentrated here. You can't really see it because how it is distributed. 
Now, if you plot logarith of I1 versus logarith of I2, this is just a comparison of two replicants. You see much better how these things behave. You even see that at lower values, these are individual counts, count of one, of two, and so on. So when you have data that are log normally distributed, you should plot it in the logarithmic scale. And it doesn't matter whether you use logarithm to base two, 10, or natural logarithm as long as we are consistent. However, it's worth, for presentation, it's worth using log base 10 for a simple reason, because it's easy to interpret. If you see five, this is log uh, four, five would be here. You immediately know that five corresponds to 100,000. But if we did it in a log two scale, then for example, 10 would correspond to what? Anybody knows on top of the head? Well, it's 1024. So log two scale is uh, not that easy to interpret as log 10 scale. Speaking of logarithms, I, I have to mention uh, John Napier, a Scottish mathematician and astronomer. Uh, he invented logarithms and first published uh, tables of uh, natural logarithms. He also created Napier's bones. It was the first practical calculator uh, made of wood, like this one. Uh, and he was born in Merchiston Castle in Edinburgh, which now is right in the center of John Napier, uh, Edinburgh University, named after him. He had theology. He calculated the date of the end of the world somewhere between 1688 and 1700. He was also involved in alchemy and necromancy. Okay, so a very universal scientist. The next distribution I want to discuss with you is a Poisson distribution or counting distribution that uh, pertains to things that you actually count. Like in this plate where you have bacteria colonies around, this is a 100 microliter, mic, microliter, sorry, 10 to minus 7 dilution of OD600 of 2. So this is from a particular experiment. And we have 10 bacteria colonies here. So this is a count. And if you repeat this experiment, do the same plating again and again and again, we'll notice that every time we have a different count. And this is again to be expected. This is a statistical variability because every time you take an aliquot from, from the solution, there will be a certain number of individual bacteria in it. And depending where we take it, it this number will, will vary. It's, it's just a random number. And this applies, this, this Poisson distribution applies to any counts in time or space, like radioactive decays per second, number of deaths in a population, or number of cells in a counting chamber, or number of mutations in a DNA fragment. So it's always something per bin. And bin could be, as I said, time or space, or time space, or, or some other things. Uh, this is an example of Poisson distribution. If you measure this over many, many, many plates, like thousands, and then build a distribution of counts, this is what you're going to obtain. Um, so this is a Poisson distribution where mean is seven. Poisson distribution arises naturally from random and independent events. All things are important. Random, there is nothing driving these numbers. And independent means each number is obtained completely independent of the other. If you try to uh, take aliquots from a bacterial solution where bacteria tend to clump together, they are not uniformly distributed, uh, the measured count will not follow Poisson distribution because they are no longer independent. And probability of observing exactly K events in, a, in, in our count series is given by this formula again can ignore it. What is important here is the number of how many counts you're looking for. There is only one parameter here, mu, mean. If you remember in, uh, in Gaussian distribution or normal distribution, there are two parameters, the mean and standard deviation. The mean tells you where the distribution was. You could shift it to the left and right on the, on the scale. Or and the standard deviation will tell you how wide the distribution is. Here, there is only one parameter, uh, mean and the sigma, the standard deviation is simply square root of uh, mean. So variance is mean. This is the property of the Poisson distribution. 
And you can see a few Poisson distributions here uh, with these lollipop plots for different means, uh, 3, 1, 4, and 10. And on top of this is plotted a Gaussian distribution with the same mean and standard deviation. So as you can see, with higher numbers, uh, Poisson distribution begins to look like a, a Gaussian distribution, like a normal distribution. That's one of the reasons it's called normal. It comes from the central limit theorem. Essentially, everything tends to um, a normal distribution. Have a look at this example because it's quite interesting. It's a very old classical example. It comes from the book Das Gesetz der kleinen Zahlen, which means the law of small numbers. And statistician of Polish origin who lived and worked in Germany, like a typical postdoc. And he studied data from, he was giving data from a Prussian army about soldiers being killed by horse kicks. And he collected data from 14 army corps over 20 years of data. So what you have here, it's uh, again, count per bin, deaths per year per army corps. So this is this is a bin. One bin contains one year and one army call. It's kind of a space time bin. And this is the original data in the in the paper he or in the book he published. And what uh, what the Prussian army officers were worried about, there is number four here in one particular year and uh, one particular army call, and they suspected some foul play. Why do we have suddenly four deaths in in one unit, while other numbers are much smaller. And Bortkevich analyzed these data and showed that it follows the Poisson distribution very nicely, and it's illustrated in this diagram here. The data and uncertainties, and I will explain later when I talk about confidence intervals, are shown by points and arrow bars, so this is real data, and the shaded uh, boxes shows the theoretical Poisson distribution with this mean 0.7 deaths per call per year. And as you can see, data follow the Poisson distribution very nicely. And also using this Poisson distribution with this mean, you can calculate the probability of having four deaths in one call year. And this probability is 0.078 in 14 calls. So it's, uh, it's, it's just expected to happen from time to time. Even a rare event will happen if you, if you wait long enough and if you do calculations here, it should happen on average once in 13 years. So Botkevich showed that, that, okay, it's just a fluke and it happens. And it be, it's because we, this count follows Poisson distribution. And the last distribution for today is binomial distribution. It's probably a bit more uh, abstract and seems to be detached from biology, but actually it is important in biological sciences, in the error estimation, in error of proportion, error of the median. What we have here is a series of N so-called trials. And in each trial, it's an event, there is a probability of either success, which we'll call P, or a failure, one minus P. There is a series of events and it could be either success or failure. And we ask, what is the probability of having exactly K successes in N trials? And this shows a binomial probability distribution uh, of, um, <clears throat> this is K number of successes. There is eight trials in total. So this is, this is the probability. And the example is when you toss a coin, this is, this is binomial distribution, what you obtain from multiple coins tossed. Uh, if you say that heads is a success and probability is 0.5, then tails is a failure and probability is 1 minus p, it's also 0.5. So this is the probability of getting a given number of heads when you throw a coin eight times. The mean is NP, the standard deviation is given by this formula. We actually come back to this, but I will remind you later when it comes to errors, uh, error analysis. Again, for large numbers uh, and probabilities, kind of somewhere in the middle, the binomial distribution looks pretty much like normal. The lollipops is a binomial distribution and the red line shows normal distribution. Conversely, for a very small 
probability and large numbers where binomial distribution looks like Poisson distribution. So depending what, what case, limiting case you have, you can replace binomial distribution either with a Gaussian or with Poisson distribution. Have a look at the example. Let's say we toss eight coins. Why is the probability of having had four times much larger than the probability of having heads eight times? You see, the probability of having four heads is here. The probability of having eight heads is here. There's a huge difference between them. And it's actually easy to notice. It's just like with the uh, two dice we, we, we used to throw in the beginning of the uh, There is only one combination of coins that leads to eight heads. But there are many ways of getting four heads. There is a formula for this. This is so-called a binomial symbol. You can read about it. You are, maybe you are familiar with this. Eight over four. And if you calculate it, it's 70. It's actually 70 possible uh, combinations of eight coins that lead to one, two, three, four heads. So this is 70 times more probable That's that's a very action to just a few probability distributions. I hope it wasn't too boring. I will show you uh, later applications of this, and these should be much more interesting. I hope so. Uh, let's now have a look at some practical part of this. How to do this in R? I recommend uh, during our induction lecture for those who are at the University of Dundee. I recommend it using R. R is a statistical language. Uh, which is very good for solving statistical data analysis problems and has lots of things built in, uh, which makes some calculations very, very easy. And if you want to calculate probabilities or p-values and stuff like this, you can do it very easily in R. So for every uh, probability distribution in R, there are three functions starting with D, P and Q. So this is for normal distribution. We have D norm, P norm, and Q norm. D is the density. It shows you this function. So if you calculate density of a value, let's say Z here, it will give you the density here, which is probably less useful unless you want to plot this curve. What is more useful is a cumulative distribution, P. That gives you a probability of of a value of a, of a random variable being less than z. So you put a number z here and it would give you this shaded light shaded area. And you can inverse it here. You can find a quantile, which is a Q norm, which simply inverses this. So for given probability, cumulative probability, it will give you z corresponding to this. Let's use it these functions. Let's use it to find a Z uh, corresponding to the uh, confidence interval. I will talk about confidence intervals later, but the probability of 95% here. What we want, we want to find a Z, this value on, the, on this axis, which corresponds to this probability. We assume it's symmetric, so we have the same cutoff probability, five per, sorry, two and a half percent, on left side, two and a half percent on the right side, and in the middle there is 95 percent. Uh, if you still remember what I told you about before, this little magical number of 1.96 that cuts off exactly 95 percent, we should obtain 1.96. Now, how can we use this? Well, this this uh, gives us a probability z corresponding to probability from minus infinity to this point. So it's a left tail probability. Uh, but we want this so we can uh, calculate the left tail probability, let's say, from this. If this is 95%, then what's in this tail is 2.5%, or it's 1 minus beta over 2, if this is beta. So the total probability here is 0.975. Okay, that's, that's straightforward. 95% plus 2.5%. And now we can use QNORM for 0.975, and we obtain this value, which is approximately equal to 1.96, the one I told you earlier. This cuts off exactly 95% inside or 5% outside. This is how you can use a binomial distribution in R. 
where is D binom, P binom, and Q binom. Uh, D binom is the value of this bar, exactly, which is the density in discrete distribution. P would be, again, the light-shaded uh, cumulative probability, and this will give you quantile. And coming back to our coins, probability of obtaining exactly two heads in eight tosses of a coin. So we, we, we do this function, and there are more parameters here. We are interested in the probability of having two heads. The size of our trials is eight. We have eight trials, eight coins, and the probability of one side or the other side of a coin, if it is an honest coin, is 0 0.5. And if you calculate it, it's 0 0.1. So that will be, that will be this bar. Or, or probability of having at least six heads is one minus this P, you know, which is a probability, cumulative probability up to a given point. We need to use five because we want to exclude this because we are asking at least uh, six heads. So that, that will give you this dark shaded area. There are uh, functions for lots of distributions, binomial, log normal, Poisson, and also some I haven't discussed. I, was, I will mention some of them later, like chi-square and student t distribution. And they all have the same format, where it's a density, cumulative distribution, and quantiles. And you can use these functions in R directly. It's a base R. It doesn't require any libraries. You can just use it straight away. This is a summary of what I told you today. Uh, fault distributions, I showed you. A uh, normal distribution is uh, sort of a bell-shaped curve. It's a continuous distribution, and it's often seen in nature. Uh, for example, human height follows normal distribution. Log normal, well, very simple logarithm of this variable is normal, and we typically see it in high-throughput experiments in biology. Poisson distribution is otherwise known count distribution, and uh, its uh, example could be a count of cells per plate. And finally, binomial distribution is success versus failure. Uh, and it could be, for example, male, female distribution in the population that roughly follows a binomial distribution, but, but there are some, some funny departures from this I will show you uh, later. That's everything for today. You can find hands out again when not yet, but I will put them on, on this website very soon, including the recording of this uh, lecture. Thank you.